check uh, the video at home or show it to someone it's on video. Um, so today we'll start with an introduction uh, what is to what is FCG and also what it is not. Uh, then we'll do a live coding session. So this means we will together with you implement a number of constructions. But Paul will well I mean code on his computer and you can all give input. And then after that, uh, you can continue in with exercises uh, on your own. And this afternoon, we, there will be more demonstrations, so you don't have to do anything. <laughs> but we'll show what FCG is used for, uh, since we are from the AI lab. We use FCG also in some applications. Um, so we'll show that. One of them is uh, a Facebook task for visual question answering. So we'll show how FCG is used in, uh, in there. And also Paul will demonstrate how you can constructions can be learned um, from yeah with some operat operators that he, he implemented. So fluid construction grammar, that's why you are all here. Um, just to get you all on the same track, uh, I want to summarize the main goals uh, of, of this enterprise. So uh, well these are actually more general goals. These are the goals of I think computational construction grammar in general. Is of which FCG is one implementation, one, one family, uh, so to speak. So the first goal uh, is um, to verify models of construction grammar and analyses uh, provided by linguists in terms of consistency and preciseness. And we've been doing this recently with a number of analyses to take a paper and then try to implement the constructions and analyze the example sentences that they give to see how the constructions uh, well, how, how it works really, how uh, they, they work together to build an analysis. Uh, another goal is to empirically, empirically test construction grammar models with corpora. That's when you have uh, a number of constructions, you have operationalized them with FCG, you could then parse a corpus to see which sentences, uh, well, to annotate sentences with this construction and their slot fillers. So, um, use construction grammar in on corporate, that's another one. Then establish a standard for exchanging and integrating um, these models. And of course, that's also why we are here today, because we hope more people start, want, want to also engage in this kind of enterprise uh, to f implement their constructions and use the same uh, data structures to do that and exchange so that somebody has maybe done modal constructions in English, another person does another part of English and you could use each other's uh, constructions to have a bigger uh, grammar, of course. Exploit construction grammar insights for language technology and that's what we are in our lab uh, doing um, mostly. I mean, we were, Paul and I are both linguists by training. Well, our first, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, but of course we moved on a bit now, we are in, in the AI lab, but we still, I mean, we don't do pure linguistic analysis anymore, but we, we like to use really the insights from construction grammar, and you will see they are very useful actually for, for a number of applications. So, uh, fluid construction grammar, what is it not? Although it's in the name, it's not an actual... Uh, maybe I'll wait. <laughs> So FCG is not a grammar. It has it in its name, but it, if you download FCG, you will have noticed for those who tried uh, or who managed to know that difficult anymore. Uh, but uh, who tried? It. So it's not a grammar. If you download it, there's no grammar inside. We have a number of grammar fragments as examples, but um, it doesn't ship with a pre-made grammar for the whole language of English, for example, or German. It's not a linguistic theory. Um, it's not, um, like you cannot ask how do you do long distance dependencies in FCG. I mean, you can do it, but there are multiple ways to do it. It's not that there's one theory. So the theory like, like for example, sign-based construction grammar or, or, or other generative theories like uh, head-driven phrase structure grammar, uh, that's not what FCG does. Yeah. Uh, you, it, it gives you tools to implement certain stuff, it's not a theory. Yeah. It's, we try to make it theory neutral, actually, yeah. so that everyone can implement this insights into it. And also, it's not a machine learning algorithm. You cannot just throw it at a bunch of data and it will learn something. So, this, well, we just list this because we, in, in discussions, we often 
here that people have a different idea of what FCG is. So what is it then? <laughs> now you want to know. <laughs> well, we define it now as a computational platform or a toolbox that provides the necessary building blocks for implementing construction generators. Um, yeah, it's a bit like when you do Nowadays, people use a lot of R to do statistics in linguistics, and you don't have to know all the details of these statistical models. You just call a function, right? And you script together. Well, of course, you need to know what it does, and you need some intuitions, but you don't have to actually implement uh, the whole um, all the equations and so. So FCG. It uh, can be compared to that as it's also a special purpose um, programming language. So you can, it's built, it gives you the abstractions to implement um, constructions. And it supports so one, some building blocks, there are more, this is not an exhaustive list, but one of the building blocks that it gives you is that there are constructicons or constructica, not sure about the plural, <laughs> uh, that support the lexicon grammar continuum. So everything is a construction. There are a lot more schematic, less schematic uh, constructions um, that you can implement. Uh, constructions are function form mappings, I would say. Uh, well, meaning. Meaning, meaning in a very broad sense. In a broad like sense. Yeah. Uh, they're mapping uh, between uh, functions and form or between form and functions it goes in two ways bidirectional so it goes from if you want to analyze an utterance it would give you a meaning representation you can also feed it a meaning representation and it will produce it will, one possible way of saying uh, putting that representation into words with the same constructions yeah, yeah with the same constructions and the same engine uh, so the same processing engine there is also, um, well, we, we do also, we want to learn constructions also. Um, and this is in the spirit of usage-based uh, linguistics that, yeah, well, we will show this actually. There are tools, tools in it that you can use for learning constructions. Yeah, but constructions. it's not, you don't have to you use don't have to. Tools, but yeah. this is available. It's, as Katrin says, it's a bit like uh, what R is to statistics with construction grammar is to construction grammar. So these are building blocks that you can use, but you can also implement extra ones or you don't have to use everything. So and there are very few assumptions. There, there, there is not like a number of features that you need to use. You can come up with features, yes? Then? Yeah, very basic question. Now, on the previous slide, so it's not a machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. And here it does make you can implement. So, so what's the difference? But yeah. You can, for example, compare it to R. So is R machine well, learning? Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it's more like a special purpose programming language. So it gives you tools <laughs> that you can use for usage-based learning. Yes. But SEG itself is much more broad than that. So you, yeah. you, can, you, you can use machine uh, learning algorithms within line. FCG, yeah. but you don't have to. Or, and it's also not as if there's one machine learning algorithm that gives you constructions then well, or then something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Okay, so it has a long history. Uh, many of you will know that. It was, uh, well, we estimated its birth around the year 2000, but probably a bit before, yeah. by inspecting old code. <laughs> <laughs> um, so by Luke Steels, he came up with uh, with this uh, idea of using function form mappings uh, to do uh, experiments of language evolution where robots were um, or in, well, in inventing and organizing languages in, in the population. Um, but later we started doing also natural languages, um, but not so long ago actually. The first stable version appeared in 2011 and then a number of books were also published on that version. But as it goes with with books, I mean, of course, then we started giving tutorials like this one, and we noticed it's actually very difficult to learn FCG. So we came up, came up with a new FCG, um, which was introduced uh, last December in uh, the last issue of Constructions and Frames. And also we wrote, uh, well, a long article on, the, on our GitHub wiki on the syntax and semantics to explain uh, the basic principles, really. Uh, and the main features of this new FCG is that uh, the representation, so we make new representations, but this means new, a new way to write down your construction, uh, which is more compact, uh, not so 
it hides also certain things that you don't have to know, uh, so it's more intuitive. It's closer to your intuitions about construction well, in general. Yes. Uh, and also visualizations, uh, so new, new uh, user um, interfaces and visualizations. And uh, it's easier to learn and use what we heard from, from people that, that uh, did it on their own. And we also now there is an FCG app, so for installing on Mac it's already much easier also to get it running on your computers. So what do we use it for? Uh, why, why are we doing this actually? Um, well, the first point, of course, is to implement construction grammar models. And, uh, well, this is the title of Bill Croft's talk um, that he gave, because actually in our tutorial today, we will operationalize some of the constructions on um, aspectual contours that he, uh, that he proposes in his book of verbs. Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the uses. Another use, as I already hinted at, is the use of FCG in evolutionary linguistics experiments. This was actually the original purpose of, of FCG. And um, Paul will later give an example this afternoon of um, an experiment that he did on the emergence of word order and the noun and phrases uh, using FCG. Which then also demonstrates the, yeah, the dynamic nature of the, of the formalism. And then, of course, language technology applications like visual question answering, and Jens will show this afternoon an application that we did for that. So, um, FCG is a component in a bigger system. Um, so, as you know by now, it maps between uh, functions and forms, which is, well, this bot bottom part here. So, you, uh, when you produce, well, when there is an utterance being, you hear an utterance, there is a speaker and typically a listener. Yeah. The speaker is on the left side yeah. here, and the hearer is on the right side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they actually share their in the same world. Okay? So that is something that they share. So if the speaker wants to say something, well, he grounds the world model in his head in the world. This is not a trivial step, because she has sensors, cameras, and so on. So he observes the world and makes an internal world model. Then, if he wants to say something, he needs to conceptualize what he will say. Okay, he makes a conceptualization based on his world model. And he comes up with the meaning that he wants to convey to the other agent. This meaning is then produced into an utterance. Again, the utterance is shared between speaker and hearer. The hearer will comprehend the utterance, reconstruct the meaning that was intended by the speaker, and then, of course, he interprets this meaning in this world model, which is also ground in the world. So, in these kind of evolutionary experiments, this whole cycle needs to be implemented, and we develop tools for each step, for the grounding, for the conceptualization, interpretation, and for production and comprehension. Yes. And FCG is actually a tool that is used for this part. So, going from a meaning to an utterance for a speaker, and going from an utterance to a meaning for the hearer. So, the dashed box is yes. what FCG actually is. Although there is also an interplay because sometimes yes. FCG can also well look yeah. into the world to validate yeah. when, whether it's on the right track because, in parsing. But it's of course much more interlaced. Yeah, process, it's interlaced. But, this yeah. Is a, but on, on a figure, it's easier to yeah. have just it as a circle. But this is just to convey that we work most mostly are interested in language in, in a grounded environment. So as it is used to convey uh, meanings. Uh, and not mainly not on texts. You can use it on texts, but that's not uh, what we are mainly doing. So that's just to put that this uh, clear. So the Constructicon, so an FCG Constructicon, well, it models one language user. Um, it's not shared. Every language user in, in our models have, have has their, its own Constructicon. And, um, well, as I already said, there is this lexical grammar continuum inherent, uh, inherently. Uh, there are different modes of organization your uh, constructicon that we provide. Uh, you can have no internal structure, just a bunch of constructions. Uh, you can implement families of constructions, so types of constructions that you group together and that are then also treated, well, in the same way. Uh, there is a network organization supported, um, so different you types of inheritance, yes, you can choose this. And it holds configuration. So the constructive com also contains a configuration that you need for processing your grammar. Processing means 
you have a bunch of constructions, and then you want to analyze a sentence, and you give it, well, you use the grammar to build an analysis. But by default, you don't have to worry about that, because there are default configurations that are already preset for you, so you don't have to change that, but you can. Uh, it implements, so how does it do bidirectional processing? There are two main functions that you will also today uh, uh, use. Uh, so there is the comprehend function, which takes as arguments the utterance um, to the sentence that you want to uh, comprehend. And uh, typically, um, well, and a constructicle. Uh, we use actually the term construction inventory, but it's the same as constructicle. And it will give you, as a value, it gives you a meaning representation back. Okay. Then there is also the function formulate, which does the reverse. You give it a meaning representation. And this meaning representation can be in a, any type of, um, yeah, you can use predicate calculus or you can use frame semantics. We have done multiple um, versions of that. So this is also procedural semantics. Yes. Well, any kind of semantics that you want to use. It doesn't impose anything on which meaning representations. And then of course also constructicum, the same constructicum. There are no different systems for for comprehension or, or, or production. It's the same. And then it will give you an utterance or more utterance. You can also say uh, if there are your grammar allows this, maybe it will give you three utterances. You can also say the number of utterances if you're interested in that. Okay, so let's get a bit more concrete. So what if you call comprehend with the sentence je chante? So I we got inspired by the first uh, opening of the conference where Alia was chant, uh, singing. So je chante, uh, this is a French sentence. Um, so FCG will translate this sentence into an initial feature structure. So FCG works with feature structures. And um, while well, you saw already in the video that there was a lot of magic happening, well, that's actually the unification process. So matching and merging feature structures together. But I hope I will explain it in an intuitive way, so you don't have to know all the formal. Uh, but, but here, no unification is going on with this. No, no. You just take, you say, comprehend, je chante. You take this uh, bunch of words, je chante. And actually, FCG does certain pre-processing step to make it in a nice format that we can work with. So it says, okay, there is a sequence, a je, when, le chante, when. It gives an index because, for example, je can be a multiple place in your sentence, so they are individual it's je's. A unique index. Yeah, and chant, so you be give indexes, so it's it's a way where you can work with it. We say, well, there is a string chant bound to this chant one. There is a string je bound to this je uh, one. one meets je chante in this uh, place uh, means okay, je is immediately adjacent to chant. So word order in FCG is just implemented like any other feature. Right? So there's no special word order, not a special thing. We don't build necessarily trees or anything. So we just have a feature, okay, je was next to chant, and je precedes chant, which means that there, well, it precedes <laughs> chant, of course. So this is just an initial pre-processing step that it does be, that we have something to start our processing with. And of course, also this, we call it uh, de-rendering of an utterance. So we have the utterance and we make the initial structure. This is also something you can customize and do it in your own way. But this is kind of a standard way that we will use today. This is a default that we will use today. So then the same goes for uh, formulation. So you give it, this is a meaning representation that was used in the small grammar fragment for uh, French verb phrases, verb constructions, that actually a student of ours implemented some years ago. Um, so you get a meaning here, it's, going, it's saying, I mean, we didn't, it's maybe not the best way, it's just open, eh? I mean, so he's saying there is a what I actually, and I is, um, <laughs> indexed or by person, by the symbol person one. There is a singer, which is the same as this I, and there is a sing event, and the sing event overlaps with the directed time point, which is the origin. So it means it's now, at this moment. So the singing is happening now, and there is a singer, and that's not me. Okay, so then it will translate this, um, well, map, this initial uh, meaning that you give oh, again to a a feature structure, but then with a meaning feature. Yeah. And you have seen, you see here this word root, 
This is a convention that, you know, your initial transient structure, all the features you get from there, you put them into this kind of unit that is the root. Okay? And constructions will later be able to take things from there and so on. So, yeah. in confidential formulation, the same process, you get your input, you put it in a certain format, and you put it in the root. And that is it's a, a way of a visualization that you will often see is this kind of network representation of meanings. It's basically the same as the list representation, but with some arrows, you see, edges between um, the arguments. So it's a bit, well, we think it's a bit easier actually to understand what is going on because you see there is a sing event, a singer, and then the, the singer actually gets input from the eye and so on. And then there are other parts of the meeting that interact with the events that adds meaning and so on. Okay, so a construction in FCG is a coupling again between form and whatever meaning it has. The construction, this is important, can consult any aspect of the transient structure. Remember, transient structure was this uh, feature structure that we have shown you. You can consider it as all information that is known at a certain point in processing. So when we start processing, we have this initial transient structure. We know that there was, you know, from Jushan the string and the word order. Okay, that is everything that is known at that moment in time is in this transient structure. Okay? Now constructions can consult the transient structure. And then, the construction is also, of course, an abstract schema that can then be used to expand an aspect of the transient structure. This means it can, so when it has consulted something, it has seen, ah, there is a first person singular in the input. I can apply. Yeah, then the construction is, well, a candidate to do something and it can actually expand their transient structure and maybe add a new, uh, well, new units uh, to the transient structure, but that's, that's yeah. yeah. Even that initial picture you showed it, there's quite a lot of grammar in there to start with. Thank you. So I mean, do I need to uh, implement tense and pronouns and all of that before I can start? I mean, yes. I have to build it from scratch, right? Yes, from scratch. Yes. So you mean which example? To like, this. Mean, not like this one. Yeah, you have to implement instructions for pronouns. It would be now and je is a first person pronoun and all that. But so this is not in here yet. Huh? Okay. okay. Yeah. So there's nothing here yet actually. No, but he means there is no construction yet for I. Yeah, but. In FCG. Yeah, yeah. But, but I. Well, <laughs> I, think, I think you meant. I, I think you meant that there has already been a lot going on to get to this structure. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Which is not true, but maybe you can back to the shant. So, so in comprehension. So this is maybe easier. So there's no grammar having going on. There is no. No, I, I can see that for this picture. Yeah. But not for the next one. Okay. But, I mean, you include things like dark the time warp. Yeah. But this is the input actually. This is so the input. You're an agent, and this is the conceptualization that you that have. That he wants to express. That you want to express. Oh, okay. It's right. okay. in the okay. other direction. Yeah. Okay. Because it goes okay. into, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the beginning, indeed, it's a bit. This already comes from. Yeah. We have also a conceptualization engine before yeah. it. But so I can see what you mean because yeah. maybe not well chosen the data. Yeah, well, yeah. It's already quite grammatical terms to, yes. to, to, to say yes. it. But yeah. But there's nothing going. Nothing has been going on here. You just come up with the meaning that you want to formulate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it looks like we need to. Have things like cancer to get some big credit information. Right? No, no. And, uh, yeah. I suppose you don't, but right? it gives the impression. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So construction is actually in, in the system, it's represented as a data structure with two parts. It's a very, again, general um, term. This is just an example, a fake example of construction that we made. So, what are the two parts? There is a conditional part. This contains the, well, as it says, conditions for when this construction can actually do something. So it's going to say when in the transient, when it's consulting the transient structure, and it finds certain features, and they satisfy the conditions of this construction. Then this construction can try to work to do something. And also, because we were in two directions, there are two parts in the there are two locks we call them in the conditional part. So for formulation again and for comprehension. So here you put the three conditions for the construction to apply in formulation. <coughs> so 
So if this is there, the construction canvas that you say work or do something, we call it apply mainly, yes. but it's, well, it's just conventional work. And here the preconditions are there for the construction to apply in uh, comprehension. And then if, it's, if all the preconditions were satisfied, it can actually contribute new information to the transient structure. That can of course be used by later constructions that will work on that. So it can add new meaning, new semantic categories or other types, well, uh, anything that you want to, your grammar to work with. Okay, so let's go through the je chante example in comprehension. So you, you have seen already this transient structure. Again, it's with two strings, eh, chante and je, and then some um, some features that indicate the order that was observed in the input. Okay, so there is first, um, there is a morphological construction that can work on this, the chance morph. And um, so we are in comprehension. So remember there were two locks in your construction. One for comprehension, which is here on the bottom. And it's very small. It's only going to look for a form feature which inside has a string uh, with the word chant inside, okay? And indeed, well, this will be found because indeed there is a form feature and it has the feature string and it ends there on the chant. And it matches it because things that are preceded by a question mark are actually variables, okay? So logical variables, like in mathematics you have variables, so x, yeah. y, z, so on. So these are variables. So we try to match, like, in the form feature, in the root, string, word, chant. We find string, chant, chant. chant. Okay, so word is a variable that is now instantiated to chant. Three. Uh, three. Three. Yes. Three. So you can match, so the construction can work. Yeah. Okay, so then it has matched. It has actually added all the rest, because indeed, uh, yeah, we had said this, but the contributing part is, well, here it's actually empty, it can be empty. But it will also be the opposing lock, because we go now from this form and we map it into, you see it's even not a meaning for mapping in this case. It's a mapping between form and syntactic features. Okay, so now, woof, you get this, instead of just one uh, unit that was there. And so these boxes we call units, you might have not <coughs> noticed. So units are packages with features uh, that, yeah, contain information that belongs together. Um, so here it's all about chant, so it's, it already added, aha, uh -huh. it is from the, the lemma is chanté, there is a verb form, um, yeah, some things about it, it's finite, um, already the singular present, so it's added a lot of, of information already, this construction. Okay. But again, I mean, this is just the idea of the student. I mean, he came up with this syntax. You There's no features that are no. predefined in FCG. Huh? You, you yes. use everything you want. It just he thought, well, uh, th tense is uh, important here, so I put some tense features in there yes. that I will use later in other construction. So okay. it's completely open. So now our transient structure is actually a new transient structure. It looks different than before. So we can continue. Another construction comes up, and it says, ah, it's the jeu pronoun. And this is... Uh, Going to map, as we see again, we go from the bottom part there, form, string, and then a variable, a je, we map it to a meaning. Uh, so it's where do we find actually, yeah, so can you see this form string somewhere in your input, right? This is the input that this construction will work on. So what is it going to match on, do you think? Yes, so in this root unit, it will match on the show. Maybe we should explain it. Yeah. yeah. So, you see that the unit here that it matches on, the name of the unit is a variable in construction. Okay? So, we don't use the name of the unit to match on the specific unit in the transit structure because, well, we, we don't know the name and you know, it can be anywhere. Okay? And normally, this can you know, match on any unit. But there is a specific kind of feature, so if you put a hash in front of it, it says I should find it in the root unit. So it should have been in the input. It's just a convention, okay? So here we say, find the form feature string word in the root unit. 
Actually, normally, conventionally, the root unit is the only unit with a fixed name because it's the only one that occurs in every grammar because that's where we store your input. Okay. <laughs> okay. So indeed, it finds je, and what it will do is it will create a new unit je three because this was actually the index that was created automatically when you when you started, and it will add meaning and all the uh, all the other features that are on the contributing parts. So here. There is a new unit, je, with meaning, form, so arguments, uh, semantic categories, and syntactic categories that it were added by this construction. Yeah, maybe I should maybe say it here. So the hash to actually search something in the roots, and it will make a new unit out of it. Yeah. It's a way of creating And it also removes it. Uh, as you yeah. see now, our roots unit is becoming smaller and smaller, because some um, information has been taken from there by constructions and added elsewhere in the transit structure. Okay. So chanter, we are still I mean, doing the morphological and the lexical constructions until our, well, we have enough material to have bigger constructions because, yeah, so here there's chanter. So this time we already have a unit for chant for, that was added by the morphological chant. Um, so now this uh, construction will actually add the meaning uh, of chant. Um, so we find these features somewhere in the transient structure. Okay, this syntax, uh, well, all these features we find it in the chant one. So uh, this is satisfied, so our construction can apply and add the meaning. So yeah. sing event and sing of the event is some singer to the uh, transient structure, yes. to, to, to that unit of the structure. So, yes. yeah, yeah, so the we match on the chant one. It exists, and we add these features to that unit. If there is any question, you can always interrupt us. So, does somebody know why the semantic categories of uh, the chanté legs are on this side and not there in the top with meaning? Why would this be? Do you have an intuition? It's a dip, I know it's a difficult <laughs> question. Remember that constructions work in two ways. And this makes it actually really, I mean, when we write grammars, we are exhausted after a number of hours because you have to think all the time in two directions. So they are here because if your chanté lex will apply in formulation and production, you will actually only have a meaning in the inputs that it will work on. So there is a meaning, there is a sing event and a singer, okay? But you don't yet have, yet have semantic categories. Something you want input. to add. That's what you want to add. Yeah, yeah. it's actually really So actually, maybe it's a clear, a clear way of explaining is that your morphological construction for chant, or chanté, or any form maps between certain morphosyntactic features sure. like the specific tense, person, and so on, to um, certain sy syntactic features, like uh, this is from the verb, the verb chanté, and chanté has a... But not yet on the meaning or the sense of the verb. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then the lexical construction maps between certain uh, features, like the lemma and so on, and the meaning and some similar features. But we will show it more clearly. Yeah. So, example. okay, now, indeed, it has gone. So this was your input, chant one unit. And now it was turned into a new, well, new, I mean, the transit structure called expanded with meaning that was added, uh, and semantic categories about it's an action, there is a semantic function, it's an event, there is an agent, uh, and some arguments of the, of the work. But it's still shown when, actually. Yeah, yeah. You took it from a different. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, it this should be shown when also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, indeed, I took it from a different... From different screenshots yeah. from... Okay, so now, uh, well, there is a verb phrase construction that will take the chance and turn it into a verb phrase with some other features. Um, but maybe we shouldn't go into too many details here. Okay, then there is a new transient structure. So you see this is a process that goes on until actually your, your constructions are exhausted, until you have no more constructions that can apply. Okay. Maybe we should, we should say something about uh, the subunit here. Ah, yeah. Well, I can say, yeah. So, 
Here we say, so we match a main verb unit, namely the chance 2, with these features, and we create a new unit, okay? A VP unit. The new unit is created, and you see that one of these features is subunits here, where we refer to this unit, okay? That's, the subunit is just a feature. But then we can say to FCG, like, use this feature, in this case subunits, but you can use any feature for drawing, you know, a hierarchy. Okay? Because it's easier for humans, I mean, we don't to like to impose that. trees in the grammar, but still it's a convenient way of, of looking at it. And here you can have different features that um, have different uh, tree structures. Yeah, typically we use constituents, or feature constituents, or dependents, dependents, or subunits is more yeah. neutral. So, but the yeah. tree structure is not bound to any word or, or anything, it's just a way of having a perspective. You can even choose, well, we can show it this often, and actually you can even have a feature constituents, for example, a feature dependent, a feature information structure, and then you just click and the units reorganize them into the perspective you want to see. It's actually for the human to visualize yeah. it. It's not implemented like in phrase structure grammars or SBCG or so on that you have really, you know, the, the structure in there. It's just a feature for visual. And also, since constructions can consult any aspect of the transient structure, you are not bound, as in SBCG, to local... Um, There's no immediate dominance no or immediate Anything like that. Okay. So you see here that then in the visualization, here the Chant 2 is drawn as a subunit yeah. of the VP unit. Yeah, so now it's put under a new unit VP and percolated some features higher yeah. up so that they can be used by but later I, constructions. Yeah. But I can't stress it enough because it's very confusing to many people. It doesn't do anything else than the visualization. There's no other yeah. things that it imposes onto the structure. It's just a way of visualizing. Okay, so then we start, we go on, the same. Now there is an intransitive clause, a construction that applies. It's going to look for a subject unit and a VP, in fact. So in some of the features that we just added and actually our new unit, well, uh, satisfy these uh, preconditions so because it's asking for a, uh, a unit with a syntactic category, phrase type VP, and then some, um, uh, yeah, some other features and a subject unit. It's also saying, but maybe that's a bit too much information at this moment, that um, the number and the person of the subjects are here. So the values of these features are actually variables, uh, person, question mark, person, question mark, number, and they are repeated in the VP unit. This means that they have to agree, they have to be bound to the same value. So it means that there is agreement between the subject and the verb, basically. So you use the same variables in both units, if they will have to have the same value because it's not variables like in like in like in R for example or like in programming languages, variables like in uh, logic, like in mathematics, like in logical programming also, where once you have a value for a variable you cannot change it anymore. Yes. I mean, your, like in mathematics, your, your x, as you say, f of x, your x cannot be 2 and 3 at the same time. It doesn't yeah. make sense. You, know, you, you have one instantiation. So it's these kind of variables. Yeah, so it also means that this construction will not apply. So it means the preconditions will not be satisfied when the subject has a different number or a different person from the verb. It will not work. Okay. And in production, it will always have it know, poses, imposing yeah. this constraint. Yeah. Okay. So the new uh, transient structure, it made a clause unit in fact, and it put the verb phrase and the subject under it. It added also some, yeah, some semantic links actually, because it was saying now that the agent of the VP, it's a bit smaller, but the agent of the VP, so the verb chanté, is bound to the argument of the je unit. So it's saying that's actually my singer. So this is also a bit done by the intransitive construction. Okay, so we go on, and then um, there is the final construction is the present, it's going to for the present tense. Um, yeah, again, it's going to look for two units, a finite verb with certain syntactic features, and a verb phrase, uh, that actually is the, well, the parent in this case, uh, of, that, of that unit, and it will add a meaning to this, to ten, the meaning of the present tense. In this case, it was defined as some overlap with the dictic time point. Okay. So this is the new, uh, the, the, the new final, final transient structure. So the new transient structure, and it added some meaning there. Okay. So how does this work? You might wonder. 
how can all these constructions just go and uh, combine in this way? So how do we go from je chante to that final meaning? Ah oh, yeah, maybe we haven't said it. Something, but the final transient structure that we saw after the present tense construction did its work. In fact, the grammar was exhausted. There were no more constructions that could work on this transient structure. And when that happens, we will extract, actually, just look at all the, the features that have the word, me well, all the meaning yeah. features. Maybe go back to slide. Yeah. So here you see in all these units, we have these meaning features like date, time, voice, and so on, and here, sing, singer. It's actually these features that we extract. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then draw them as a network. Yeah. So then we draw them as a network. Okay. And this is the meaning that your system gives back. And also in the new FCG, there is a new visualization that shows you actually how the constructions, um, so how the constructions depend on each other. Yeah. And it's, it's, well, we have the experience at co co construction grammarians. Um, I like this uh, representation better because it abstracts away from the transient structure. So it actually shows how the constructions actually share things and the constructions fit together. But of course, in order to implement it, the constructions need to work on the data structure to do something. So that's where the transient yeah. structure comes in and is important. Yeah. But we really see, because this is only the solution, I mean, this was the solution, and it worked, <laughs> to this uh, analysis. But we really see language as a problem-solving process, and this is, I think, it's important to to get this. I mean, you will, it will well, illuminate the rest of the day, I think. So you know already that there is the initial transient structure. This is created automatically. I mean, nothing can really go wrong. And then constructions can just shoot. I mean, you can go if you can work on the transient structure. You do your work. So there can be multiple competing constructions that can do something at the same time. So you just pick one. Well, there are some, some receipts, but let's say there's just the first one can go. It makes a new transient structure. And every time we check, is there, is it already a solution? State? Is this, uh, can we stop here? Or do we need to go on? And then it goes on and on and on. But sometimes no more constructions can do anything with the transient structure, but it's not yet. A solution, so you can go back. Yeah. And and it's like a, a search space. So yeah. you go back and you try all the path and all the construction and so on till you get a solution. But you will ask why there's a solution, yeah. and that is also actually that you define yourself. For example, the simplest tests <laughs> that people use is, uh, for example, if there are no more constructions that that, that yeah, can apply, exhausted. that's a solution. Okay. And you will only have one path, of course, because. Here it's exhausted, you know, it's a solution. But more, uh, more um, importantly, what we often do is, it is a solution if all parts of the meaning have been nicely integrated. If it's into one network. network, for example, the meaning. So, and that's a pretty good approximation, like normally, then it's, it's a solution. Of course, when we do it with the whole semiotic cycle and we actually have a world model and so yeah. on, then we check whether the meaning that we interpret in the world model is also consistent in the world. So that's even a better, Yes. An easy, well, an easier or a better way to know whether you have the right solution. Of course, if you have an annotated corpus, I mean, you know your sentence has these constructions that should apply, or you have a meaning already that you are expecting, you could also compare yeah. it to that. If you have an annotated corpus, If you corpus, have a gold yes. standard, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it's more easy. Yeah. And if you find something like a, a sing for peace, so that would be, so where would the, the system go? Would it first go to us? To other syntax and say it is transitive, or if, if you have never encountered this in the past, so how will you be able? Is it going to be able to learn on one side the syntax and the, the lexical part? Yeah. Or this, where did the system learn? Well, it depends very much on how you implement your your grammar and which construction you think this is and how this is implemented. So. It's difficult to say, there's no way that FCG handles this. There's just a way you implement your constructions, mm -hmm. and then FCG will find its, w its way. So it depends on your analysis of the sentence, actually. Okay, okay. So yeah. uh, it's, diff it's difficult to answer. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's we also said that there is, um, well, there are some new visualizations, and there's a well, a user interface to, um, to 
FCG. So this, I'm, I'm just going to show it, but we'll come back later also to the same interface. So this was the grammar that the student wrote. He, he added 55 constructions to it. Uh, it was only for verb phrases, it's actually in French. Um, so, and then you see here, this was the application process that we went through, uh, just on the slides. Uh, but here you can, you can inspect it. This is a, an, an interactive uh, web uh, interface. So you can inspect it, you can look on the units, okay? You can click also on variables and then it will light, uh, light them up, uh, okay? And you can see every step. Also, if you click on it twice, like uh, I will do here, you see the source transit structure, so this means the one from the step before. It will see, the, you can look at the construction that was applied. It also highlights actually the conditional lock that it used to insult the transient structure. And it will show the resulting structure with some colors to the units to it, which it did something. Green means it added a new unit. Yellow means it changed something to that unit. And it also gives you the intermediate meaning already that was built up. So you can see at every step how this is um, unfolding. Okay, so okay. you can click almost everything click because everything. there's so much information that it's collapsed. But if you want details, yeah. you can always. Wait, I will just I will collapse it again. And then you also get your the constructional dependencies. Um, so how the construction? So the intransitive clause actually dependent dependent on, on input from the verb. Phrase construction and the and the je pronoun and then this one by another construction and then you see here again uh, because these are actually the, the search as we see language as a search uh, problem uh, this is a search application process there can be multiple branches this was just an arrow uh, I mean there was no search in fact it just continued to work to search. And then you can see here the constructions that were active in a different, well, just a list representation. Uh, you get the resulting transient structure again from the final node in the search. Um, and you can also, again, I mean, you can click on everything. Uh, you can also see here, for example, that the semantic, so the, the singer, the, the, the me, so here the meaning, this logic variable, it's here bound, if you click on it, it highlights, you can see, ah, because otherwise sometimes these structures can get really big, this is just je chante. So you can imagine if it's a long sentence, and this helps to you see, ah, it's the agent of that unit. So you can more easily spot certain things. And then going in the other way, um, so here you start with an initial structure, we saw this on the slide, then. Eh? Oh, sorry, this is again. Sorry, here, uh, formulation. Um, you start with a meaning, and then it uses the same 55 constructions, but um, we can look at it for je, for example. So it's going to use the je pronoun, but now you see the other lock is highlighted, so the meaning is going to be used. Uh, and then it's, it's really the same process over and over again. So you need I mean, to understand it once, I think how the consulting of the transient structure and the matching works and then the rest is, we call it merging all the rest Yeah, of match and merge, so you yes. match the light blue part which is in formulation of the upper lock yeah. and then and you merge. branch in the lower lock and you merge all the rest of the construction you merge the other lock and the contributing part into the transient structure yeah. and here you But merge is nothing to do with, with, <laughs> with uh, minimalism or anything it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a computational algorithm that has yeah. the same name so. <laughs> And then, yes. in production, you can also see here the form being built up. So here you see there is a string already, one string. And if you look a bit further uh, along, you can see ah, here uh, there are ah, there's still only one string. Okay, sorry. Yeah, the order of the construction is. I mean, there is no predefined order in which they are. Yeah, yeah. but you, if you want it in your grammar, you can define the order. Yes, yeah. we think. Well, it's a bit against the idea of, of construction grammar, where constructions combine freely yeah. to impose an order on construction as well. Some people do it too. So then the resulting structure um, is again a clause with a verb phrase and um, well, a subject, a pronoun. 
And now, instead of extracting all the meaning features, which is what it did in comprehension, it extracted the meaning features and then it drew some, a fancy network of that. Now, instead, it looks at the form. Uh, oh, sorry, the form features, which are there are actually ah, oh, there's no there's no work orders. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, okay. So it's going to look at the form features. In this case, there were just two strings. I would have expected that there was also a loop um, yeah. constraint, but okay. It will use that and then compute the word for So the student that implemented this grammar, he let uh, ah, sorry. the intransitive apply, but didn't put any word order in the in the construction. So Shan Chu would also have been parsed. Okay. Of course, if you would uh, write it yourself, you would say, okay, in, English, in French, well, you should have a word order. Well, or you have a subject predicate. So yeah, you have another construction that can do it, so it doesn't matter. So, there, again, we want to stress there are only a few assumptions, no predefined features. You can implement different languages, different analyses that use different features. This is no problem. Uh, there are no grammaticality judgments, so the fact you, well, we've shown you this search, I mean, search, as Paul already said, the, a good solution, I mean, this depends on what you call, what, I mean, you can add some grammaticality judgment if you want, but this is not what we do. No, normally we just get the material that gets as an input, and yeah. even if it's not covered by the grammar, we try to do a, a, as good as possible yeah. analysis of it. And, and if we're lucky, there's some, some repair mechanisms or some learning mechanisms that will incorporate it. But uh, yeah, we're actually not often interested in rather mathematics. Well, you mentioned uh, agreement earlier. Yes. So you have an agreement, restriction agreement features, so that would be. Uh, that would result in ungrammaticality, that would result in something that cannot be passed. So there are ah, yeah. things that can't be passed. And but it will always return a solution. So indeed, ah, okay. this is a good question. So if the intransitive construction, which was actually doing in that grammar the agreement, it couldn't do its work, it will just return the final, so yeah. how far it got, and it will give you that. So it will say, okay, there is a je and there is a chant, but we don't know how they, come, how, well, there's, yeah. oh no, actually, that's common. There is maybe a nu and chant, and it doesn't yeah. combine. So it would give you a meaning network that is not connected. Yeah. Or if you want to be really robust, you use an application you want to be really robust. Yeah. It also inclu includes algorithms that uh, okay they detect that no solution is found, and that's actually if, so. The jeu enchant. If I apply an intransitive, there's only one thing that blocks it. So it's only this agreement. So that actually generalizes over this agreement and that says, okay, it's the best thing I can do, so maybe I'll try, I'll just relax this feature and still yeah. apply it. So this is for increasing the robustness if you if you if you have it because if, if there's a you know a learner of Rand that he says you shan't, well you will also understand it, you will process it. So we also try to yeah. get this into FCG to be very robust. Yes. yes. Hello. Okay. So as as we, I already said, uh, there you, we have made s uh, multiple small grammar fragments for different languages, and I will just show you uh, some examples, like in English. Uh, this is from a grammar. I just took it last night from a number of grammars. Like in English, there was a, a grammar um, about yeah that uh, this is a lexical construction for baking. It uses I mean you see it uses similar features. I mean this is more conventional. Use syntactic categories, semantic categories, and so on. Um, so some arguments. So there is the action based as an action with a baker and a baked and so on. Okay. But for I could go back. Ah, or or do you? Yeah, I will. Okay. Yeah. So for example, if you say lex cat lex cat verb here, no, the verb it doesn't mean anything to FCG. It's just a symbol, you know. So you had verb, you know, in the previous grammar uh, that we saw. This has nothing to do with. The Symbol verb here, and just you know that it's a verbal thing. It's for the humans to read it, so yeah. there's no there's no uh, external meaning to it. Yeah, and again, there's Dutch cat construction. <laughs> okay, there's some semantics. This was in an experiment actually that a student of mine did on resemanticization. Well, it doesn't. We are not going into details, but these semantic categories of tangible and not countable were important for that experiment, so she put that in. 
Okay, in terms of phrasal construction, this is silver experiment that we did. So where actually this construction is illustrating that a construction can cover multiple words. I guess it's a phrase to form, uh, form the teller. So the whole prepositional phrase is in one construction in this example. Okay. This was also in the context of learning. Of learning, yeah, with the robots learning certain things. And it also says something about the case and so on. So, okay. So let's go to the well, to the theory that we want to to analyze uh, today. So briefly, uh, it's it's uh, sort of theory by uh, by Bill Croft, who was at the conference, um, um, and he he um, suggest well he uh, proposed this theory in his book Verbs a number of years ago. Uh, Verbs is well, he's actually describing his factual types um, in there. Which it's actually a typological analysis, the book, uh, but he worked it out in detail for English. So we only looked uh, for this example uh, grammar at, at his English analysis. And um, yeah, more in detail, it's in chapters 2 to 4 if you want to read up on it, but I will summarize it very briefly. So he says that aspects so can be studied on at least two levels, and you will know that all. I'm not going to read this too much. So there's lexical aspect, of course, which is in the verbs and a grammatical aspect added by inflectional or periphrastic uh, distinctions. Um, he also um, goes back to the Vendler, Vendler classification of um, four classes. Um, so there are verbs uh, that are uh, states, there are verbs that are activities, achievements and accomplishments. So he also splits his, his verbs into these four uh, classes and then each class has, well, uh, every each of these classes has some properties, um, which are, are well binary distinctions, static or not, etc. But yeah, this is nothing new. Um, well, they were of course intended for lexical, aspectual um, types, but he says in English they should be attributed to predicates rather than to verbs themselves. So he gives some examples uh, for that. Like uh, states, it's be Polish, to be polite, etc. Okay, accomplishments, read the book. So, so you not start just read, and yeah, because read is seen as an activity yeah. for him. So, okay. Yeah. So how do events evolve over time? This is one of, and he showed this actually in his keynote talk here as well. There is a two-dimensional geometric representation with an a on the x-axis you have the time and the y-axis is for him the qualitative state, uh, which can be discrete or um, continuous. I will give some examples of these diagrams you might remember. Um, and he says th this is actually his representation is a subcategorization of the Bandler, original Bandler classes with four kinds of states, you know, three kinds of achievement, two kinds of activities, and two kinds of accomplishments. But we shouldn't, maybe we should go uh, to our example. So, yeah, these are the states uh, that he uh, describes. So, yeah, so he always gives these kinds of, of uh, diagrams. So, the time dimension here, the qualitative dimension here. For example, for let's, let's see, the window is shattered. You start in a not shattered state over time, at some point it gets shattered, and you end in the shattered state. Yeah. And well, that's that's what uh, that's it actually. Okay. Yeah, three kinds of achievements. Uh, yeah, here the profile phase is really a single point in the well in the temporal dimension, uh, and is yeah, a transition always in the qualitative uh, dimension. Okay. And there, there are two activities. Uh, either it's a continuous, so a directed activity like the soup cooled. Or it's a cyclic or undirected activity, like the girls chanted. So these are two types that he distinguishes. And uh, yeah, we'll also do that in our grammar fragments. So uh, also he has two types of accomplishments. One is an accomplishment that yeah goes up smoothly. <laughs> so like I ate an apple pancake every time you have eaten a bit more, but then for him. He never, well, Harry repaired the computer, it's more a relative achievement, you repair a bit and then you fail, well... Yeah, yeah that's how he describes it. Describe yeah. it. Sometimes it's difficult to make a distinction whether it's a gradual thing or... It also depends right. on your skills. Yeah, if you're a good computer repairer, actually it's kind of, yeah. you know, you don't go back a lot. <laughs> but the important thing is that the aspects, well, 
uh, aspect is defined, and so he speaks about aspect of utterances, not uh, of, of, of verbs, because, and even not of the predicates alone. So the, the aspect of contour really depends on the multiple of factors, or multiple factors, like, of course, the semantic properties of the verb has something to do with it, but not everything, there are the so, tense aspect yeah. constructions. So the first one, for example, like reaching, the verb reaching has like something of an accomplishment in, in it this. already, whereas like reading or smoking or, or dancing has more a thing an activity in it. So there's the lexical aspect of the verbs. Then there are the tense aspect constructions like the perfect, the present, and the progressive that can add to the spectral contour, the presence of objects and their type. Um, I think if you have. Uh, Smoked the cigarette. I think this is one of the examples. Yeah. Right? So there, it's achievements, it's achievements well. because of the well, the definiteness. Yeah. Your yeah, cigarette goes from a state uh, like a non-smoked state to a smoked state. So he smoked the cigarette is like an achievement, whereas yeah. he smoked cigarettes yeah. would be an activity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, and then also, adverbial groups can contribute to the aspectual uh, contour of the utterance, like durative adverbs, every every morning, um, things like that. Yeah, for four hours. Yes. So we will look now at, well, we uh, actually, how it, how it will go. I, I implemented the grammar fragment, um, so that those part of this. For, and it can, well, we tested it on eight sentences from Croft's book, um, all about uh, dancing. <laughs> so, um, and I'll show you well, his analysis, maybe not of all eight sentences, but of the first three, and then we'll try to do to start together writing some constructions so you get a feel of what it actually how how to how to start, right? Yeah, and then you at have the end theory how you can implement And then at the end I will give you the solution. I mean so you can go home and you have something that's that runs and that you can you can uh, if later you want to develop more constructions you can start to look, have a look at that. So the man dances is the, the most, well, basic sentence in this, um, that our grammar can handle. So dance is, of course, well, he, Croft defines it as an undirected activity. Um, and, uh, well, this is, well, the, the picture, that's... That's, um, that's a basic, uh, the basic category, of the, category of the verb. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's the basic category of the verb. And then the man dances, yeah, it's a bit... Uh, yeah, the man dances is seen as a as a generic property. Yeah, he of dances. That man, he dan he, he's a da he dances. He's a dancer. The man yeah. dances. Okay. okay. So okay, it's so a property of the <coughs> of the man. I know, sorry, sense, maybe or I'll habit show. or or how you want to call it. Yeah, wait. So I will maybe show two more. So then he talks about the man dances the sirtaki. Also, he sees it as a so Croft analyzes this also as a permanent state of a generic property. Although it's, of course, it's an acquired uh, property, he sees it. It's, uh, he wasn't born uh, dancing the same talking. Um, then the man, the man danced. So in the in the preterite, the man danced to the sirtaki is an accomplishment. So because you dance. start on the sirtaki as a dancer, you dance it from the beginning to, to the, the end. end, and you go from a state in which you the sirtaki is not is not danced, but at the end, you know, your so, sirtaki is danced. So you can also. Stop intermediate and not complete, it's like yeah. an accomplishment. Okay. Yes. And, and it's finished at the end, right? you, yeah. when you have danced the sirtaki. And another example, the man danced to the sirtaki for an hour, so it's just dancing, it's undirected. Um, or the man danced the sirtaki every day. That, although it's preferred, he also analyzes it as a generic uh, property of that yeah. man. Or a yeah, generic property, he also calls it sometimes habitual. So yes. the every day actually influences. Yeah, influences oh, yes. uh, the aspect uh, very much. Okay, so I think we can go now um, to our coding session. Maybe do you want to do your